Welcome into a special edition of Inside Carolina Podcast. It is never an off season here, and that means we are talking UNC football. I'm Tommy Ashley. We're sponsored by Johnny T shirt. Mm. That is Jason Woo. Staples. Jason Staples of Scouting Report fame this time of year, folks. And if you've been on the Inside Carolina message boards and been on the Inside Carolina Premium message boards, especially, you've Noticed multiple scouting reports of the transfers. Carolina bringing in a class of at least eight transfers, six of which are on campus currently. And Jason has been going through the list. We're going to do the most important one that everybody feels is the most important one last. I'm personally going to start with the most important ones for me, and that's the offensive lineman, Jason. And let's let's go ahead and blow it out. Let's start. Georgia boy. Austin, Austin Blasky transfers to North Carolina from Georgia. He is on campus. We've seen his interviews on Inside Carolina. We've seen the written articles. Those that are on premium have seen your scouting reports. Just sort of put your scouting report in podcast form here for, for Carolina fans. Certainly a big, big young man that comes to the offensive line ready-made for what Carolina needs, I think, right? Yeah, and and one of the good things about Blasky is he's a guy that could actually play potentially all five positions on the offensive line. Now, not at once. That would look kind of like a, you know, Carolina offensive line from a few years ago, maybe. <laughs> but uh, but no, he's he's a guy that could play right tackle. He could, in a pinch, play left tackle. He's played some center, and if you can play tackle in center, you can play guard. So uh, one of the things that that, that that allows is he's a guy that, that he's going to make the offensive line better. It's just a question of where. And, and he allows, depending on what other talent fits where, he allows you to kind of move guys around. And, and you know, if he's better here and somebody else is going to be a little bit better than what the other option would be over here, then he can do that. And... You know, if somebody gets hurt and you've got a little bit better situation as his backup where he's been starting, he could slide over. He's one of those guys that that just has a lot of capacity to play across the offensive line and uh, and, and do so pretty well at each spot. I mean, I don't think he's a uh, an elite player, but I do think he can be a, a player you can win with at pretty much all five of those spots. I, I think... Just looking at his game, I think he's a guy, and especially with the other guys that they're that they're bringing in. I mean, they're bringing in a series of guys that are basically offensive tackle prospects. Uh, I think he's a guy that that probably they would like to see win the center job uh, with what he did at at, uh, at Georgia, and you know what he could bring to the table as a as a center prospect. I mean, he's six five three ten. You'd like to see him get a little bit more bulk. To add to that, especially if he's going to play center, you know, you'd like him like him to maybe be three fifteen, a little bit, little bit stronger uh, at that spot going in, going into the uh, into the fall. But he carries his weight really well. He's a uh, he's a guy that that you know moves his feet. He's got excellent feet in terms of 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 that size. You know, you, you see him uh, get out there and move in the screen game, that sort of thing, and and can be pretty impressed by his fluidity. There are times where he almost looks like a tight end. Uh, there are times where he bends a little bit too much at the waist. So, you know, I'd like to see him, you know, when he's at, at, uh, at offensive tackle, there are a number of times where he's just not sitting back, sitting down into his, into his hips with the, uh, with pass protection to be able to anchor and, you know, kind of is a little bit vertical with his lower body. And then that forces him to, to lean with his upper body and that'll get him, off balance, sometimes get him pushed around or, or, you know, guys will get the edge on him a little bit. So that's the one thing I'd really like to see. And that, ju- that comes a little bit with, you know, just getting stronger through the lower half and, and getting a little more flexible through the lower half. He's not the most bendy guy uh, in terms of that good feet doesn't bend quite as well as I'd like to see. But I think in terms of, especially if you put him at center and he's a guy with that weight and with his ability to move his feet, he's not a guy that's just going to get blown by uh, on the interior and he's not going to get pushed around a bunch on the interior with the bulk that he's got. 
So, you know, I think he's a guy you can win with at center. And I think if you, if you really need him at, at, at tackle, he can play there and obviously at guard uh, as well. But I think the real value here is at center. And I think he could be a, uh, a guy that at least uh, hits pretty close to the level that Corey Gaynor gave you last year. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting when you hear Pat Sotis, um, North Carolina's general manager, and others talk about how he's got a little Corey Gaynor in him. It's sort of a tale of where they might put him as well. And and after watching Willie Lampkin in the bowl game at center, um, and, and I think Willie is, is a very good guard for North Carolina, but I, I thought he struggled at center. And when we're talking about a guy that's 6'5", 3'10", 320 versus a, a young man that's 5'11", 280. I mean, that is a gigantic size difference at that important position. Um, it, it'll be something to watch, but I agree with you. I think center's his spot, but to your point as well, having guys that are cross-trained, having guys that can move around certainly helps. Put and that he, he's also, like Lampkin, he was a very good high school wrestler. He was yep. he competed in the 285-pound weight class in the state of Georgia, and uh, I think he had one season where he went pretty close to unbeaten if I, I don't I, I don't remember the exact record but he had like 40 wins so uh you know I like guys who wrestled in in yeah. high school especially for interior line positions because those are guys that are used to being in there and grappling a little bit so uh I think he's I think he's a really good fit I think could be a plug and play center who you know you you feel like you didn't have any drop off at all from from Corey Gaynor who is a you know pretty good player there for the last couple of years and and was sort of the core of that offensive line. And if you can replace him with a guy that has two years left to play, that you, you feel real good about that. Yeah, we're talking with Jason Staples, of course, inside Carolina's football expert recruiting, or excuse me, football expert analyst, something like that. <laughs> all, those, all those big, fancy, high-level words get, get by me sometimes. Another guy that comes in um, to North Carolina, transfers in, somebody that Randy Clements certainly – has intimate knowledge about Howard Sampson, North Texas transfer, 6'7", 330-ish, uh, a mountain of a man. And certainly you lose Diego Pounds in, in the portal to Mississippi, you bring bringing in another guy with a massive young man, a massive potential on the edge. Sort of talk about Howard Sampson and his, what he can bring to the table and, and what you glean from his film, Jason. Yeah, Samson is, you know, sort of fits the bill of of a traditional kind of guy that that Clemens likes to recruit, and and that basically boils down to guys who have something freakish about them. <laughs> if you look at those old Baylor years, you know, under Art Bryles, they like to go and get guys who are you know three hundred and eighty pounds for that guy, you know, six 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 seven for this guy. Uh, they, they, he likes somebody who's really good at something. That, that you can build around. And and Samson is one of those guys who he's six seven and I think his arm I think I, I I'm really curious what his what his wingspan is because I think it's I think it's a good bit over that six seven mark. You're looking at a guy just watching him on the hoof looks like he's close to a seven foot wingspan. One of those guys with really long arms uh just built like a basketball player but still over three hundred and twenty pounds. So you know that's a good thing if you want somebody who can who can uh, make it difficult to just run around him in pass protection, uh, and uh, like you said, a guy that that Randy Clements recruited uh, recruited to uh, North Texas when when he was there. So, you know, I think actually interesting. You mentioned you know Pounds not being there. There's actually a lot of similarities physically. I think between him and uh, Trevion Green. They're, they're, they're pretty similar body types. I think Samson's actually a little bit quicker and, and has, I think, a little bit more basketball player type feet than what you, uh, than what you see from, from Green. But he's a guy that I think just projects well as a pass protector first at this stage. Uh, I think a little bit quicker uh, in, in terms of his, of his feet naturally than, than maybe Diego Pounds as well. He, he is another guy that I'd like to see bend a little bit better in, you know, in terms of sitting down into his hips. Uh, and he's a guy that, you know, you've got to worry a little bit sometimes about those six, seven guys playing a little bit too high. 
especially against some of the uh, the better power rushers in the uh, in the ACC. And I do think at this stage, really the 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 concern you have with him is getting bull rushed early on in his career while he's still building the lower body strength and, and, and all of that to be able to do that. But I do think he's a guy that that just in terms of his natural ability to move and and mirror and do all of those things, he's he's a legit prospect. He's a guy that I really like. He's a guy that that for a guy that's that's his size, you know, his feet are pretty surprising. And, you know, you feel you feel pretty good about that. Uh, again, a lot to work on in terms of the of the the finer points. You'd like to see him be able to sit back. You'd like to see him get a little more depth in his in his set a little bit uh, at times. You'd like to see him, uh, you know, make sure that that he's prepared in terms of which hand to use in certain spots. Uh, and he did get run around one time uh, in in the reps that I looked at in the Tulsa game, where you know the edge edge player just just blew by him, and it was just a matter of he just didn't match the speed with his with his drop, so or with his uh, with his set. So he's got to get get a little bit better on all those things but i think the physical ability the the tools are are there for him to be a better than a better than average acc offensive tackle it's just a matter of how quickly can he get there and you know can he be there this year and i think that's the hope you you really like to have that kind of lump of clay to work with though and he he has uh he has a lot going for him there yeah and he is on campus so he'll go through spring practice he's been in the off season thing in spring practice starts in March. So he'll have that full thing. The other two guys don't want to spend a ton of time on them quite yet. You have scouted Ja'Kai Lefwich. So let's talk about him first at Georgia Tech, another massive human being, 6'6", 3'11"-ish. Um, I think you've watched some tape on him, and, and maybe he's not exactly that size. He'll be in the summer. Um, just briefly on him from Georgia Tech coming over to North Carolina, We've seen how Georgia Tech's been able to do certain things to Carolina on the football field. Um, in the trenches, what's Leftrich bring to this Tar Heel team? Well, I mean, he started against North Carolina in 2022. So, you know, they uh, they had some success against Carolina that year, and um, and he was one of, the, one of the starters on the offensive line. He started at, at right tackle. And he's a guy that, uh, again, two years left, and you're looking at 659 snaps in the ACC. Now, in terms of his overall grades on that, I think he's been basically a replacement level player, maybe just a little below replacement at times, maybe just hovering above. But, you know, he's basically been a replacement level right tackle. And so, you know, you feel you feel like even if even if nothing else changes, and that's that's playing as basically a freshman and a sophomore there, uh, if he's a replacement level player there, in those first two years, if nothing else changes and he's a summer report and he gives you that, then at least you feel like you've got decent depth at the tackle position, if nothing else. And he's also played some right guard, which I think is important. So most of his reps have come at right tackle, but he's also played at right guard. And, you know, they want to make sure that the, I, based on what they've done in recruiting with, with this position, I really think what they're going to try to do is cross train guys and find the best five. And then you have a sixth guy that kind of rotates through and they're just going to find the best five, figure out where they fit and make them and, and find, find out if they can get a cohesive unit out of it. And, and that makes sense. And left, which may end up being one of those guys. Now you mentioned, you know, I, I, I I'm not sure he's actually as low as three eleven. I think he might be a little bigger than that in terms of his overall weight. Uh, but you know, I think he he's he's a guy that that is interesting to me because I think there again is a little bit more left in his game that he hasn't fully developed. I mean, his hands are a mess. He does kind of like to bear hug at times, but there are times where I I found you know on poles and in some of his past sets, it's like man, he's got really nice feet. He he moves well. He he packed a a, a nice wallop on some on some poles. The other thing that I think is maybe the best thing about him that, that I noticed is going from 2022 to 2023, when I got to take a look at what he looked like in 2022, and I started nitpicking and noticing, okay, well, you know, 
bending this way it needs to stick on blocks a little bit better different things and then i turned on the opener against against louisville which he started in 2023 and there was significant improvement in several of those areas on the 2023 tapes so this is a guy that that actually worked and got better from year to year so that that makes it interesting and again he's a guy with a couple years left um you know, I want to see what happens as he gets a, a little stronger. He did get pushed around a little bit at times. Guys got up underneath him, and and he can get, especially in that in that lower half. And and well, actually, with him, it wasn't lower half as much as I was worried about. Is is his upper body strength? He's a guy that uh, now that now that I recall, he's a guy that his upper body I think needs to get a little stronger. There were guys that were able to shed him when he got his hands on him at times and kind of pull him off balance at times. That. Uh, it's just a strength issue as much as anything, a little bit of uh, a little bit of technique. I think there's I think there's a lot of meat left on that bone to get better. And and he's a guy that that wouldn't surprise me to see him starting this year, even though he is a summer guy, just because I think the the physical uh, the physical tools are there to be, you know, replacement level or better in the ACC. And if he does improve a little bit year over year, then you know maybe maybe even a little bit better than that. So again, you. At this position, at the offensive line position, you can't have too many big bodies that can actually play. And you, what you have to do is you have to bring in those numbers, figure out who fits where, get your best five out there, and 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 go cook. And I think he's a guy that gives them the chance to do do more of that. And again, position flexible. Yeah, and, and you mentioned uh, you can't have too many bodies. It's going to force those guys that are coming back to be better or they will continue to be on the bench, and that's always a good thing across sports, but definitely on the offensive line. Uh, I want to take you back to Muhlenberg County, or rather Muhlenberg College. Uh, Zach Where? Greenberg. Uh, <laughs> it's a great song, man, Paradise by John Prine. Look it up. References the county, um, but let's talk about the college. Zach Greenberg, he is a, a young man that's coming from D3. He'll be in the summer. Um, have you had an opportunity to check him out on tape? And what have you seen thus far? I know there's a lot more work to do here. Uh, but it's an intriguing prospect. I think people automatically see D3 and, and say, well, you know, my neighbor who's 5'11", 165, plays offensive tackle at D3. It's, <laughs> you know, so, but let's talk about Mr. Greenberg a little bit. So I think when you're scouting a guy from that level, you kind of have to think of him as, you, you have to kind of treat it like you're scouting a, a a combination of a high school prospect and a JUCO transfer, right? So, you know, a number of guys in JUCO aren't any better than guys that would be at a D3 program. And, you know, when you're recruiting a, a high school offensive lineman, he's going against guys generally that are worse than D3. Now, there are a few leagues in the country where the overall level of play might be higher than D3. You're thinking of, you know, some of the places maybe in Houston or, you know, Miami or whatever, but those, you know, most, most high school linemen are playing against those guys. Uh, so you kind of have to grade based on movement patterns, based on body type, based on a lot of those things. And I saw a guy that was intriguing. I mean, he's got two years remaining. I think as a summer enrollee, odds are in year one, he's a depth guy. He's a guy that you bring in hoping he can compete. But the thing is, I mean, First couple reps I saw of him, I see a guy at, you know, 6'4", 290, running out in front on a screen, and the movement skills were really impressive. And it was like, okay, he's an athlete. Is he a guy that could get stronger? Absolutely. You can tell he's not been in a Power 5 uh, strength and conditioning program. But what that tells me is at 6'4", 290, you get him into a, in, into a Power 5 strength and conditioning program for a year. And maybe that's suddenly six, four, three Oh five. And you got yourself a player. Uh, I, again, I looked at him and I went, yeah, I can see why he's a take. And you know, the movement skills, the, the feet, uh, he's actually a guy that, that bent surprisingly well. I mean, he, he was a guy that actually did get down through his hips and could roll his hips and, and do all of that. All the stuff that you want to see. The real question with him is what's going to happen when he actually has to go against a guy who's a power five level defensive defensive lineman. He hasn't had to do that before. Now, like I said, the body type, the 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 
Uh, the talent physically, I think, is there to potentially be a guy that can do that. You just have to project, and and hopefully that all that all clicks when he gets there. But I, I think he was worth a take. Yeah, and I, I think your point, and, and when I was saying, talking about how people tend to poo-poo D3 football, um, I think your point about it being a situation where you're evaluating guys in high school all the time going up against guys that are physically and superior better than. So it, it's a good analogy there. Greenberg, of course, be here in the summer again, another big body and another – like you referenced earlier, a, a lump of clay that they can mold. And with the two years of eligibility, it certainly be a thing. Let me take a second talk about Jason's favorite folks, Johnny T-Shirt. JohnnyT-Shirt.com. Sponsors of this podcast, sponsors, as always, of Inside Carolina Premium subscribers. You get 10% off. I mentioned it on my Scott Forbes video today. They've got all the baseball jerseys. They've got all the swag you need. Visit them on Franklin Street. Visit them online. Let them help you. And also, congruityhr dot com front slash tar heels get your free assessment for your small to mid-sized business you see their logo on the screen here another important sponsor of inside carolina let them take care of your small business grow that small business to a national business like they've been able to do themselves congruity hr.com front slash tar heels national guys will pay the bills on the audio version but on the video version we're going to keep right on rolling jason this is one that you know, the transfer portal is something. Once upon a time, there is not a chance that a player would drive down I-40 West from West Raleigh and park in Chapel Hill. Uh, Mr. Harris, Jakeen Harris, did that very thing the day he entered the portal, I believe. We're close to it. Come on over. Safety from NC State. One thing you can say about NC State defense specifically those boys play tough and they play physical, Jason. What did you glean from Harris's tape? And what's he going to bring to, quite frankly, a defensive backfield that needs some safety help? I will say it does make me a little nervous just in terms of angering the football gods when you have guys, uh, you know, going back and forth between rivals. There's there's something a little bit, you know, it is a, weird. It's, a little bit, it's a little bit freaky, but... You watch Jakeen Harris, and you go, yeah, you, you know, he's he's going to be a player at that safety position. He's plug and play. He he walks on campus, and he's an immediate starter at strong safety. Let him just let him out there. Let him learn the defense, and let him go. Uh, 5'10", 200, and he's a guy that is happy to play in the box. Physical dude. He will come from depth. He's a very good blitzer and will come from depth coming downhill with zero regard for his own life and will take on whatever he sees. I mean, he'll take on an offensive lineman. He'll take on a lead blocker. He will do whatever. Uh, one of those guys who just, you know, takes that kind of physical uh, approach to the game. Uh, and in a lot of ways, I mean, he's, he's kind of similar to Stick Lane, but with a good bit more size. I mean, Stick is Stick comes downhill and does all of that in the same kind of mentality, but Harris is a is is a bigger guy. He's two hundred pounds. Um, and the other thing that that stood out when I when I watched through a number of things there uh, with him at, at State is this is a smart cat. He he is a guy that he was very rarely out of position. In fact, I could probably out of the. I'm not sure how many snaps I watched to him, but I don't think I saw him out of position more than a couple times. I mean, he's a guy that was consistently in the right spot, uh, consistently understood what his role was, what his job was in, in, in situations. Uh, if you go back to the North Carolina game from a couple of years ago, uh, back in, what, 2021, he, uh, let's see, well, actually, no, 2022, he, you go back and you watch that game, and he very nearly picked off a, a, a throw to Josh Downs on a on a screen, on the uh, you know down down in the goal line area, that you know he jumped the route in a way that showed this is a guy that understands tendencies. He looked at this formation, looked at where Josh Downs was lined up, and was like, "I'm I'm I'm going now," and just super smart, ran the route for him. Should have should have picked it off. Uh, really, really good player for those reasons. Now, 
still has some limitations physically. He's only 5'10". He's a little bit stubby. doesn't have super long arms. There are times where guys broke tackles on him because he didn't get them wrapped. And I think he's pretty average in terms of his long speed. He's not one of those guys that you know can play full sideline to sideline as a uh, as a center fielder because he just doesn't have the wheels for it. But he's a guy, and, and he's not a guy that you can you know isolate on you know a Josh Downs in the slot and feel like he can go one on one. Though there aren't very many of those guys out there. So you know has some limitations, but he understands his limitations, plays within them, and again, very very good. Uh, fundamentals does everything, everything right and does it physically. So, I mean, I think you're looking at a better than replacement level player generally, just above replacement level player at safety, you know, not a all ACC candidate, but not a guy that hurts you on the football field and the guy that does keep your defense in the right positions. A lot of times you could see him directing traffic back there. He understood what was happening and, uh, and he's a guy that makes your defense better by being out there. He played a ton of snaps from North Carolina State. He was hurt last year, I think four snaps into their first game of the season. But, yeah, uh, I mean, he brings the traits that you need, especially North Carolina needs in that defensive backfield from the safety position. Uh, Staying in the skill guys, with the skill guys, Darwin Barlow. You know, once upon a time, it was who has – who is tailback you? Is it North Carolina or is it Southern Cal? And now you have a, a guy from Southern Cal coming to North Carolina and Darwin Barlow. Jason, a lot of people watch his tape and say he's very similar to Amari and Hampton. Sort of break him down a little bit. Similar size, um, similar styles, but what's Barlow bring that maybe will help Amari on out there in that backfield? Well, I mean, first he brings a guy that's six foot two twenty and brings a physical running style that where there's not a not gonna be a huge drop off or a huge change when he gets out there now similar in a lot of ways to Hampton, like you said, similar body size. Uh, in some ways, I think there's a little bit more similarity to British Brooks because he doesn't have, you know, Hampton has the get, get out in the open and he's got run and hide speed in terms of the long speed. Barlow is, I think a little quicker than he is fast in the, in the, uh, you know, in the, in the long speed category, but he is quick. And, and one of the things that sticks out most about him is the balance. Uh, I mean, I know some folks are looking at this and going, it's a guy that only had eight carries last year at USC and 16 the year before. I mean, geez, I mean, it can't be that good, but you got to remember USC, and I'm talking about the real one now, USC has had a whole lot of talent on that offense. And they also threw the ball an awful lot. Uh when you actually put the tape on and you go, okay, well, how good is this guy? He averaged 10.1 yards a carry in 2023 on those eight carries. He averaged six yards a carry in 2022. And back when he was at TCU, he averaged 5.9 yards per carry at 428 rushing yards. So he, he's a guy that can be productive. And the, and like I said, the balance sticks out where guys are hitting him in the midsection. They're starting to wrap up and he does not go down on first contact very often. And you pair that together with a guy like Omari and Hampton. And now you don't have to give Omari and Hampton the ball 300, 330 times. He can be better on the, on the carries that you give him because he's now sharing, sharing that load a little bit, which they would have liked to have done last year a little bit, but guys got dinged up and you got to have numbers at, at running back with guys that can, that can make plays when they have it. And I think Barlow fits really well with what they want to do in the, in, in getting the ball downhill as a, as a power running back. Yeah. A lot of times people will say, well, if he's so good, why didn't he have so many carries? Why did, to your point, he was productive on the carries he had. Maybe look at the coaching staff that wasn't running him enough. If he's running for 10 yards a carry, but to your point, Southern Cal pretty good on offense. So he, he comes from an offense that was pretty good. He comes to North Carolina and will be paired with Amarion in a backfield that should be something else to watch for North Carolina fans. And they also had Marshawn Lloyd. I mean, he averaged – Marshawn Lloyd had 116 carries and averaged 7.1. I mean, they were productive at that at that running back spot. It was There were not a whole lot of – you could be a really, really good running back. I mean, a, a potentially all-conference running back and still barely see the field there because of what they had in front of them. Exactly. It's all relative, folks. Tight end Jake Johnson. North Carolina's going to start the Johnson & Johnson Law Firm back up. 
course, old school, well, somewhat old school folks, Curtis and Leon. Now you've got Leon. Leon. Now you've got Jake and Max. Let's start with Jake Johnson. The biggest thing for me is not his production at Texas A&M. It's the fact that he was one of the top, if not the top, tight end prospect in high school. Goes to, follows his brother to Texas A&M, Jason. North Carolina tight end room stacked. And he just stacks it a little bit higher with what he brings. What's he bring to the Tar Heels? So what you're looking at with him is a guy that can be a complete tight end. Notice I said can be. He's still not there. 6'6", huge wingspan. One of those guys that's just a, an enormous target. But he's still, he's still developing. And, you know, I, I think he's a guy that, that given his playing style, I'd like to see him add another 10, 15 pounds and become a little bit more of an inline slash type. What they did at, 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 uh, at Texas A&M with him, they moved him all over the place. They, they put him in the slot, you know, kind of flexed. They lined him up out wide at times. They used him a lot in the wingback role, did a lot with him to kind of put him in positions to be a bit of a matchup problem. And he was a matchup problem. He was a guy that they could run on the fade route against corners out wide. He was a guy that, that uh, was a problem for, for linebackers inside. He's one of those mismatch guys. But to me, the value for him is that you could have a guy that if he gets just a little bit stronger, especially through that lower half, I'd like to see him, you know, really work through the, the mobility and the ability to, to, to drive through that lower half if he can become a, a plus level blocker, and there are times where he flashed it at Texas A&M, and then there were other times where he definitely didn't. <laughs> you know, he got run through a little bit. Um, if he can make, take that step as a blocker, you're looking at a guy now who you can you can put out there and force teams to go big because of what he can do for you in the in the block as a blocker. And now you've got a major mismatch. To me, he fits a little bit between uh, Nesbitt and Copenhaver in terms of what he brings to the table right now. Uh, I don't think he's quite as reliable as a blocker as Copenhaver, but I think he's a better natural receiver. Uh, I think, and he's definitely not the not as fluid an athlete, and you know, not not as much of a hybrid type player as as Nesbitt. Nesbitt, I almost think of as a as an as a big wide receiver, uh, whereas Johnson's more of a a little bit slimmer tight end. Uh, and then, you know, Copenhaver is a little bit, uh, a little bit, I think more complete at this stage, but Johnson, I think is, is he might be the most talented in terms of what he could become of the whole bunch. And he's got two years left. You know, he doesn't drop balls. He had one drop all season last year, 4% drop rate, which is, you know, that meets my threshold for, for good hands. And, you know, four catches against Alabama, including a touchdown. You know, a guy that was able to get open there. Uh, but he's not a guy that gets open with explosion. He's a guy that gets open with size and length and posts up on you a little bit more. Uh, a lot to a lot to really like and a lot to continue to think that, that you know, this is a guy that Kitchens is going to love. He's going to love working with because if he can find a way to, to motivate him to, to get just a little bit better at those, at those physical aspects and the physicality and the approach to it, he's got a guy he can turn into a draft pick. Yeah, I think he has three years. Actually, they they oh does he? He redshirted. He he gets a red shirt for that first year. You know, Freddie Kitchens is the guy that has a, a has keys on the wall. He goes and grabs a set of keys. He goes in his garage and he's got three. He's got a, a Bentley and he's got a Ferrari and he's got a Lambo in there. The tight end. I think a has. couple of these. I think a couple of these guys are a little bit more uh, pickup trucks. But they're hey. good ones. That's at Carolina needs more pickup trucks. And and what 100%. Kitchens wants is he wants to have he wants to have some some uh, some Hemi's in there to be able to get after you and really you know he wants th what they're trying to build right now what this offensive staff is trying to build and you can see that by the kind of guys they're bringing in the offensive line by bringing in a guy like Jake Johnson by bringing in a Darwin Barlow they're wanting to build a bully now. North Carolina has not been a, that kind of team in a long, long, long time. I mean, what, Natron means maybe? 
consistently at least back to Natron. I mean, you might go back to the Johnson and Johnson days. I mean, I remember Leon Johnson, you know, doing his thing. But even then, the offensive line was a bit of a weak point, and they weren't able to just, you know, to pound teams. But they want to be able to run the football to get downhill as the first thing that they do and, and to do that against everybody. And you could see that even last year with what they did. They had Drake May, and they still featured Omari and Hampton. And they still went big with a couple tight ends. What a guy like... Jake Johnson allows you to do is he gives you three a third tight end that you can now rotate those three guys for what you want and put two tight ends out on the field sometimes three tight ends out on the field and still and, and to be able to pound teams now again Johnson at 6'6", 240 you get him to 6'6", 250, 252, 253 area a little bit more bulk and I think that's what they're going to want here to be able to put him and Copenhaver both out there and then just run downhill, hand the ball off, then go play action. That's what they want to do. So many defenses have gotten smaller to compete against the against the spread. They want to be able to go big and push those defenses around. Great point. They need more trucks. They don't need no Lambos. They need more trucks. Sounds like the cat dog speech we've heard so many times. Uh, last but not least, Jason Max Johnson. Clearly, North Carolina fans look at this transfer as the most important one. I, I've said from the beginning, I, I think the other positions maybe are a little bit more important. But Johnson comes in to compete with Connor Harrell. We saw Connor Harrell in the bowl game until he got dinged, flashed some things. Um, Johnson has his own history of injuries, um, but he's fully healthy. He's in Chapel Hill. He's brought his brother, but really – the leader of the offense, Max Johnson, along with Amari and Hampton. Jason, what did you see from the tape? Um, my favorite play that you didn't highlight from Max Johnson's career is the Florida guy that threw the shoe that <laughs> cost Florida a, a chance at the playoff. Um, and he was asked about that the other day when they introduced transfers. But just Johnson overall, uh, left-handed quarterback would be different for North Carolina fans other than uh, Nathan Elliott a few years ago. But – this is a guy that there's going to be a lot of pressure on to perform for, for Chip Lindsey, for Mac Brown in this offense. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, he's exactly the same size as his brother, 6'6", 240. And, you know, interesting thing is there's a lot of similarities between him and his dad as a quarterback. You know, his, his dad, dad wasn't that big, though, was he? Oh, his dad's a big dude. His dad's 6'6". Six, six. He's not 6'6", six, six, but, you know, I, it's been – 20 years since I was around his dad. His dad used to come and throw with us in the summers because he was still in the NFL. He'd come back and, uh, and, and come back to Tallahassee some, sometimes and throw with us. But Such a small uh, world. But yeah, he was he was 6'4 plus at least. He might be 6'5 uh, and he was probably 235. I mean, he was a big dude. Um, but some similarities there. And, you know, Brad didn't actually start in college, interestingly, but he did win a Super Bowl. Um so, you know, a little bit of late bloomer genetics maybe in that family <laughs> in that respect. But, um, but no, there's some similarities there. And he's not going to blow your doors off and, and, be, and be the most impressive. You know, he's not Drake May. And a lot of, a lot of fans are going to have to get used to that. <laughs> Drake May isn't walking through that door. Sam Howell isn't walking through that door. But he's a good player. And, and you're looking at four years of, of SEC experience. He has started in all four years that he has been in college. He has started at least one game. And if you go back to 2021, which was the season where he was healthiest and had the longest stretch of, of starting, and you think about some of the guys that have beaten him out. Connor Wegman is going to be a, a first rounder from Texas A&M. And Jaden Daniels is another. So, I mean, this is a guy, you know, oh, well, you know, he hasn't been able to hold on to the job all the time. Well, no, but, you know, compared to Daniels and, you know, he's, there's two first rounders that have beaten him out. Um, and even with that, he still was able to go out and put up numbers at different points. The best season he had 20, it was 2021, where his numbers actually look pretty comparable to what Drake May put up this last year at Carolina. Now, he had a better supporting cast at, at, at LSU overall with that. But he also was facing a better set of defenses week in, week out, generally in the SEC West, and given who they had in, in non-conference that, that year. So what you're dealing with, you're, you're, looking at with a, you're looking at a guy who comes in and he's seen it all. 
He's absolutely seen it all. He's, you know, he started against Alabama, what, three times? He started against LSU twice. You know, this is a guy that has, has seen a lot. And you're not pride very often in this state. Big luxury bringing a guy in out of the transfer portal who also has played in three different offenses. I think in five years in college, this will be his, this will be his fourth offense. So, you know, that's something to, to kind of monitor. But once you, once you've started to learn how all those things fit together, it can help the learning curve. And, and I think that's going to, that's going to be helpful in terms of him being able to pick up, you know, and, and hit the ground running. He can make every throw. There's not a throw he can't make. Uh, there are times where I think he's actually too comfortable from the, from the pocket, from when it gets muddy and he's a little bit too, he, he doesn't move quite to, uh, move away or move into, you know, free spots in the pocket as much as I'd like. And that's something that I'm sure they'll try to work with, but I'm not sure how much more improvement is going to be made in that stage or at the, in that phase at this stage of his career. But, that said, there are times where he makes throws from cramped pockets with guys right in his right in his hips. You're like, how did he make that throw? Uh, you know, he can throw the ball vertically. He's very good on play action, uh, and you know that's what they're going to be asking him to do. They're going to ask him to run a lot of play action, push the ball downfield, and protect the football. And he's not a guy that turns it over a ton. So, the real questions: Can he? stay healthy. He's not stayed healthy for a full season yet. I don't believe. Uh, and again, part of that is that just like Drake may, he would hold the ball too long in the pocket. It's 240 pounds playing the big Ben role. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to take the shot and I'm going to, I'm going to make the big throw and I'm going to wait that extra, extra beat because I can. And sometimes when he did have turnovers, it was because of that. It, the, this guy's going to be open and just a bit, just, just to, and waiting a little bit too long and then gets hit on the throw and that sort of thing. Uh, to me, the biggest criticism I had of his game is he didn't get rid of the football early enough too often. And there were too many times where I felt like there was somebody who was, who based on the concept, you knew this guy was going to be open, throw him open, throw it early, get the ball out, don't wait until he is open. And there's been too many times in his career where he's been a wait until the guy's open, then throw it player. If they can get him just a beat earlier on those throws, the ability to put the ball on the money and be accurate. And I've seen it a few times. And there's one play in particular in my scouting report where you can see him. He releases it. There's pressure coming. It's a zero blitz. He releases it and throws it well before the receiver's open. It shows he can do it. If he can start to do that a little bit more consistently, now you're looking at a guy that can put up some numbers in an offense that's going to try to pound it and then throw, you know, throw high, uh, throw big play type opportunities downfield. He's got a chance. He's got a chance to be a good player at, at Carolina. Uh, just some things to clean up and and NFL type body, you know, prototypical looking guy, and a better, you know, a better athlete, a better mover than you'd expect. Uh, you know, he, he does show the ability to make some plays on the run and, and, and get out there and, and, and do quite a bit, uh, with his legs. So not a statue either when he decides to pull it. So a lot of positives. And I think a guy that, that fits really well with what they want to do offensively. Yeah. If you haven't checked out Jason's scouting report on Max Johnson, check it out. There's a lot there, a lot of film work there, a lot of comments as well. He's going to compete against the ghost of Drake May and Sam Howell his entire time in Chapel Hill, too, at least until he proves to people um, that he can do it and do it well. That'll be the, the one thing to watch. We'll certainly follow it all through spring, of course, all through summer, and then when the season kicks off. He'll be here before you know it, even though it doesn't feel like it here in February. What you got? And he's Some another rest? guy with two years left. Yep. Right, because of the COVID year, so he's started four. He's he's started in four different years in the SEC and still has two years left to play at Carolina. College football in this day and age, absolutely it's weird, man. We're gonna have. Hey, you can't talk about experience, that's for sure, because these guys all have it. Jason, I know you've put in a ton of work doing these scouting reports, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk about them here. 
Uh, North Carolina spring practice opens on March the 19th. We, of course, be, I think it's the 19th. Could be wrong. Maybe the 18th. I guess I probably should have checked before I said that. But at any rate, that week in March, we'll be there. Inside Carolina will be there. One of the most fun things for me, Jason, is standing next to you at practice, watching you look out upon the people that you've scouted <laughs> on tape and seeing them in person. We'll be doing it again this year. Anything left? A anything? I don't want to sort of grade the class. It's way too early for that. But all in all, you think North Carolina sort of filled the needs, at least on paper, that they need to fill. Um, they're still – you know, there's always a need for a defensive lineman. The portal will open after the spring practice, and you will do this all again, I'm sure. But with this set of guys, you, you think North Carolina should be pretty pleased with the, what they've pulled? So, so yeah, I do. And one of the things to, to think about with that is I, if you look at the programs that have had success in the transfer portal, and I would consider North Carolina to be one of those programs. I mean, you look at Elijah Huzzy, you look at a number of these guys that have uh, that have had success – you don't just go out and get guys that that have, you know, the traits or, you know, that were maybe highly regarded coming out of high school or whatever. One of the most important things in the transfer portal is landing guys who fit the culture that you want to shape in your in your program. If you bring in the wrong kind of guys, you're you're actually making your program worse. And every indication of all the guys that I've that I've looked at, that I've graded and and you know, researched at, that they brought in. I go, yeah, this fit makes sense. Every single one of them. You go, okay, I can see why they would bring this guy in. He makes sense for them here and what they're what they're looking to do with this. So I think that's a big a big factor here. And out of these eight guys, there's not one guy that I go, man, why would they bring him in? Not one. So there's not one guy that I think is dead weight. I mean, even you look at a guy bringing in a guy from D three, you go, well, there's a little bit of a risk there, maybe. But there's enough traits that it's worth it's worth the uh, it's worth bringing in and having having him as a as a potential contributor it might take an extra year, but you're going to need that guy. So, you know, I I think I think they did a really good job of not only identifying what they needed, but finding guys that that culturally fit with what they with what they thought they uh, or with the kind of culture that they're trying to reshape. Good take there. Good way to end it. That's Jason Staples. I'm Tommy Ashley. We've been sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and Congruity. Check them all out. Get online. Support our sponsors. Do everything you can. Support Inside Carolina because there's plenty of content coming. Like I said, spring practices ahead. More Jason Staples work all throughout the no off season as we're here at Inside Carolina talking football in February. Jason, I appreciate it. Thanks, Tommy.